Hey guys, I'm Sonia with Medlife Mastery and I'm so excited to be back for another car dissection. Um, so the passage is titled, Happiness, the Self, and Human Flourishing. So before we start reading the passage, we always want to go through and scroll through the passage and just see if there's any titles or subtitles that'll give us an idea as to what the passage is about. I don't see any here, so let's just get right into the passage. What is the essence of well-being? Philosophers have long pondered what constitutes a life lived best. While answers range from virtue and meaning to pleasure and prosperity, intuition pulls many toward happiness. But simply equating well-being with subjective happiness proves flawed. Deeper reflection illuminates happiness not as mere hedonism, but an aspect of self-fulfillment central to human flourishing. So this, we can kind of tell the passage is talking about what makes up well-being. And they throw out a lot of ideas, but it seems like they focus on happiness being the essence of well-being. But it's not just pleasure, and it seems like there's some other aspect that allows for self-fulfillment. So let's keep reading. Consider two cases. Henry lives a life of comfort, material success, and enjoyable hobbies, yet feels a persistent, pervasive sense of dissatisfaction and emptiness. Or Claudia, who despite modest means and physical limitations, maintains an abiding feeling of contentment and joy. For many, Claudia's happiness signals she lives more fully in accord with her nature. But why? So this kind of gives two examples based off of what the previous paragraph talked about, where Henry has like material pleasure versus Claudia has some kind of self-fulfillment. And so they're getting at the core of why those two kinds of happiness are different. On a hedonistic view, happiness equals the balance of, sub of subjective pleasure over pain. But the value differences between Henry's and Claudia's lives resist explanation in purely hedonic terms. Neither wealth nor hobbies intrinsically pr provide more pleasure than poverty or infirmity. Yet happiness shortfalls can profoundly indicate lives gone awry. Again, just kind of like really emphasizing the fact that happiness is not purely like pleasure over pain. And there's some other aspect that allows for Claudia to be more happy than Henry, even though he has more material goods. Understanding happiness as part of self-fulfillment better captures the significance. Central aspects of, one identity, of one's identity include emotional dispositions and characteristic moods. Radical, sustained shifts in these signal changes in one's very self. Subtle, affective changes seem superficial, but deep anguish or joy shape who we are. Thus, a happy life fulfills one's emotional nature, constituting an impo important part of well-being. So this kind of like really goes into the importance of really understanding happiness as a part of self-fulfillment. And it's kind of saying that happiness as self-fulfillment rather than pleasure is more important. And it really fulfills one's actual like being or one's emotional nature, as they say. So unfettered pursuit of happiness falters. We value autonomy, knowledge, achievement, and relationships, not just positive feelings they produce. And dark emotions serve functions too, resisting elimination. So authentic happiness must accord with reality and preserve what makes life meaningful. Within such constraints, happiness retains intrinsic worth as part of self-fulfillment. So this kind of captures a different idea that it's not just happiness that allows for self-fulfillment and that there's other things also that play a role. And it's not just the goal of life shouldn't just be to achieve the maximum happiness in a sense, because there are realistic constraints on that. But those constraints actually improve the value of happiness. And so they're important for happiness to exist. So it's not only happiness that will allow for your total well-being. This account conflicts with some theories equating well-being with success and rationally chosen pursuits. But choosing valuable activities need not fulfill emotional needs. And realizing objective goods presupposes motivation dependent on subjective engagement. Reason alone cannot explain well-being. I think that last sentence really summarizes that paragraph really well. Basically, reason alone cannot explain well-being. There has to be some other thing. It's not just success, but it's your emotional happiness that really provides for you to be well. Yet accepting happiness as self-fulfillment raises questions. If mood-altering drugs produce happiness, does that fulfill one's nature? Perhaps if they restore natural functioning distorted by illness. But if they induce artificial euphoria unrelated to reality or achievement, the happiness seems hollow. So this captures an important part of happiness that the author is trying to emphasize, that it's not just the feeling itself, but it's how the feeling allows you to achieve some sort of self-fulfillment in your life and how that allows you to then go on and accomplish the things that you want to be. And it's really about happiness's interaction with reality that allows for that real self-fulfillment and that real well-being. And might gains in happiness undermine self-fulfillment overall? 
Adopting a cheerful disposition may require abandoning meaningful commitments at odds with lightheartedness. Well-being likely involves fulfilling multiple complementary aspects of one's identity, emotional, rational, and beyond. So although they said before it's not just reason or that reason alone can't explain well-being, here they are saying that happiness alone can't explain well-being either. There's also other aspects, including rational and like reasoning, that go into it. While parallels exist, this self-fulfillment account differs from Aristotelian versions. Classical approaches emphasize developing universal human potentialities, especially reason. But here, fulfillment stems from idiosyncratic individual identity, with sentiment as critical as logic. Reason alone cannot reliably judge self-realization. Here again, they're kind of emphasizing that it's not just reason, and in past versions, although there are similarities with happiness and reason leading to self-realization, there has to be something about emotion or sentiment that really leads to self-fulfillment and well-being. Still, happiness occupying center stage in well-being theories will strike some as disturbingly facile. facile. Preoccupation with emotions seems to invo invoke a therapist's couch rather than a philosopher's podium. Yet perhaps the elevation of reason and conceptions of flourishing reflects habit more than insight. If moods color our very experience of living, can their importance be so easily dismissed? So here the author's kind of addressing potential critics' um, opinion, which is that happiness is too subjective or it's too sentimental to really be the core of well-being. But the author is saying that, well, moods kind of color our experience. And so you can't, happiness is important. You can't just kind of dismiss its importance. And onto the last paragraph, Perennial debates continue regarding the composition of a life well-lived, but the persistent intuition linking happiness to broader well-being finds explanation in a eudaimonistic approach incorporating self-fulfillment. Happiness signals fulfillment of one's emotional identity, an important constituent of self, even if not the entirety. Its absence signifies failure to flourish in accord with one's nature. In moderation and truth, happiness yet illuminates the path to human thriving. So here the author really nicely sums up the entire passage's argument. So they're saying that although happiness is really important and central in the role of one's well-being, it's not just happiness that allows for that, but still even though there are constraints on the happiness according to reality and like real life situations, happiness itself is really important for somebody to thrive in life. So that kind of seems to really sum up the overall main idea of the passage really well. So let's go on to the first question. The author's viewpoint is most aligned with which of the following statements regarding the relationship between happiness and human flourishing. So before reading the answer choices, we want to kind of think to ourselves, what is the question asking and kind of come up with an answer for ourselves. So the question is asking, which of the following statements is the author most aligned with about the relationship between happiness and human flourishing? And for me, I would say without looking at the answer choices, I would say that happiness is important for human flourishing, but it's not the only thing that's important. So let's read the answer choices and see if one of those matches. A, happiness is the sole and definitive measure of human flourishing and a life should be judged as well lived in proportion to the amount of subjective happiness it contained. So the author already gave a couple of counter examples to that situation, for example, like drugs that artificially induce happiness. And we know that happiness is not the sole and definitive measure of human flourishing, that there's other things that also go into it. So we can definitely cross out A. B, happiness is an important intrinsic aspect of self-fulfillment and, and human flourishing, but not the entirety as meaning, virtue, and reason also play central roles. That really sounds like the central argument of the passage, again, focuses on happiness and its role in self-fulfillment, but also brings in other important things that the author talked about. So I'm going to click B for now, but let's check C and D just in case. Any pursuit of happiness detached from moral value, moral virtues or objective accomplishments is hollow and hedonistic, and thus fails to truly indicate human flourishing. Again, this one seems a little bit too extreme. It talks about any pursuit of happiness that's not related to moral virtues, but I think the author would agree that there are multiple things that go into happiness and that there probably is some, at least a little bit of an objective accomplishment that allows for happiness. So I'm gonna take out C and we'll check D. While happiness may correlate with well-being, it does not necessarily cause it, as many other objective goods more reliably lead to human thriving in the long term. While the first part of that statement may seem like it's correct, we have to really focus on the second part where it focuses on objective goods more reliably leading to human thriving. Even in the last paragraph, we see that happiness is with some caveats, really the, the source and the key to human thriving. And so 
bringing in objective goods, especially because they're materialistic goods that we know that the author doesn't want to focus on in terms of what happiness is, we can pretty much cross out D and leave B with our most correct answer. So let's move on to question two. Based on the information presented in the passage, which of the following hypothetical experimental findings would provide the strongest evidence for the claim that happiness plays an intrinsic role in self-fulfillment and human flourishing? So to, re to rephrase the question in my head, it's kind of asking which of the following would give the strongest example or the strongest evidence that happiness itself leads to self-fulfillment and human flourishing. So happiness is the cause of self-fulfillment. So let's look through the answers. A, a study showing people who report higher levels of subjective happiness exhibit greater motivation and engagement in value-aligned activities. So we know that value-aligned activities is something that's going to increase self-fulfillment. And so here they're showing how you have higher levels of happiness and that leads to you having greater motivation and engagement to do your value-aligned activities. So it kind of does seem like happiness is causing those value-aligned activities and which is causing the, that, that self-fulfillment. So A seems like a strong option. So we'll keep in the running for now. Um, and let's move on to question to answer choice B. Brain imaging showing certain pleasure centers are activated when people make self-affirming moral choices in line with their values. I think this is a tempting answer to pick because it's showing a relationship between self-fulfillment and happiness. But remember, we want to prove that happiness itself causes the self-fulfillment. In B, the self-fulfillment is causing the happiness. Doing those activities is causing though that pleasure center to activate. And so B is not going to be strong evidence. Let's go to C. Survey results demonstrating people prioritize happiness above meaning, relationships, knowledge, or virtue and ranking components of a fulfilling life. Again, this shows that happiness is important for a fulfilling life, but it doesn't show that happiness plays a direct role in self-fulfillment and human flourishing. So we're going to go on to D. Interviews with centenarians attributing their long-lasting well-being more to a cheerful disposition than specific accomplishments or ideal living conditions. So the author already talked about a cheerful disposition in the passage, saying that it's not just a cheerful disposition that, allow, that allows for happiness. It's really about self-fulfillment and choosing things that are aligned with your values and will help you feel like you're thriving. And so D focuses a little bit too much on the cheerful disposition part. Um, and so I think A is a really strong answer. So moving on to question three, based on the information presented in the passage, which of the following best describes the relationship between hedonistic and eudaimonistic conceptions of happiness? So already in my head, I know that hedonistic focuses more on objective pleasure, while eudaimonistic focuses on a more subjective self-fulfillment and like flourishing aspect of happiness. So let's look through the options and see what aligns with that. Hedonistic conceptions view happiness as pleasure attainment, while eudaimonistic conceptions see happiness as part of broader self-realization. That one does seem correct, so let's keep it in the running. B. Hedonistic conceptions equate happiness with physical pleasures only, whereas eudaimonistic conceptions include intellectual and emotional pleasures. That one also, it feels like it's leaning in the right direction. The word only here is kind of throwing me off. It feels like something that's indicating that this answer is a little bit too narrow or too extreme. I'm sure we can come up with some examples how it's not just physical pleasures for hedonistic conceptions. We know that in the passage they talk about hedonistic conceptions just wants to max out the amount of pleasure that you have. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical pleasures, even though the passage just focus on it, but it's just about having more pleasure than non-pleasure. And they say that somewhere here about on a hedonistic view, happiness equals the balance of subject subjective pleasure over pain. So again, they're just talking about to total overall pleasure, not really talking about how that pleasure is obtained. And so I think A here is still a stronger answer. Moving on to C, hedonistic conceptions focus on subjective feelings, which is already kind of wrong. So I'm going to take C off the running. And then D, hedonistic conceptions value only ephemeral happiness, while eudaimonistic conceptions value long-term sustained happiness. Again, maybe it's true, but we're kind of extracting information to get to that conclusion. The passage doesn't mention anything about long-term or short-term happiness, although we can maybe assume a little bit. I still think A is probably the most supported by the passage, especially in this question that wants you to rely on information that's presented in the passage. So we're going to stick with A and let's move on. Question four, based on the passage information, which of the following hypothetical findings would most strengthen the author's assertion that happiness has intrinsic value as part of self-fulfillment? So this one, again, focusing on happiness and proving that happiness has intrinsic value as a part of self-fulfillment. So A, a study showing people who cultivate positive emotions through meditation report higher life satisfaction and engagement in meaningful activities. So this is saying that 
those who seek positive emotions or those who seek happiness report higher life satisfaction and engage and engagement in meaningful activities, which we can say is pretty close to the meaning of self-fulfillment. So here we can say that happiness does have intrinsic value as a part of self-fulfillment. So A seems like a pretty strong answer. Let's keep it in the running and move on to B. Survey data indicating people rank happiness as more important for well-being than economic stability, social status, or romantic fulfillment. Um, so two things here. One is, again, like the previous question that we had before. This is about ranking happiness as more important than other things, but doesn't really talk about self-fulfillment. Here, this is other types of kind of fulfillment. Maybe self-fulfillment is a piece of that, but really the author defines self-fulfillment as engaging in meaningful activities that align with your values. And so while B might be a little bit tempting, I don't think it's as strong as A. Um, so moving on to C, cases of individuals who exemplify virtuous ideals and make profound achievements yet report persistent unhappiness. So it's kind of the opposite of what we want. It's kind of associating self-fulfillment with unhappiness. And so we can take out C. And then D, interviews with healthy elders finding a majority attribute their longevity most to genetics rather than sustained contentment. Again, the opposite of what we're looking for and probably not really relevant to the passage. And so I think A really answers our question very well. And onto our last question, number five, based on the passage information, which of the following scenarios would most weaken the author's, author's assertion that happiness has an intrinsic value as an aspect of self-fulfillment? So here we're being asked to find the exact opposite evidence as the previous example. So the previous was how happiness is able to lead to self-fulfillment or able to have an important part in self-fulfillment. Here we want to weaken that claim. So we want to find something that proves that happiness does not is not important for self-fulfillment or is not required for self-fulfillment. Uh, so A, a longitudinal study showing individuals who experienced trauma-induced depression were able to return to previous happiness levels through antidepressant medication. This one is a little irrelevant to the question and the passage. It's talking more about resilience than happiness leading to self-fulfillment. And so I'm not going to consider A. B, cases of people abandoning meaningful commitments and relationships in order to pursue new activities aligned with increased positive emotions. So these meaningful commitments and relationships just in order to pursue new activities seems like they're abandoning self-fulfillment, but they're still, it's still being increased with happiness. So it's kind of saying that you can find happiness without it leading to self-fulfillment, almost in a sense, um, and kind of like disassociating the two. Um, so B seems like a strong enough answer, so let's keep that in the running. C, data indicating people who undergo cosmetic procedures and purchases aimed at boosting their mood are no more likely to engage in self-fulfilling behaviors. So this is kind of talking about how you can do things to boost your mood, but it's not going to lead you to engage in self-fulfilling behaviors. Again, this is kind of like an extrinsic value of happiness because you're doing other things to create that happiness versus this one is talking about how happiness has an intrinsic value. So some kind of self-motivation that then will lead to self-fulfillment. So C doesn't seem like it's proving what the question or it's disproving what the question is asking. So let's go to option D. Interviews with celebrities finding many attribute their career success more to perseverance and talent than a cheerful, positive attitude. Again, this kind of goes back to the author's paragraph where they talk about theories equating well-being with success. Again, not really relevant to happiness itself, even though they're saying that success is attributed more to perseverance than happiness. It's not talking about these activities being self-fulfilling. We don't know whether they are or not. And so I think we found a pretty clear answer choice in B. And so that's the last question. I hope that this walkthrough was helpful. Um, but as always, if you need any additional help, MedLife Mastery Tutors are always happy and available to provide some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And we also have a bunch of resources on our website, some more walkthroughs and some other free passages and some tips and tricks that can help you along the way. But as always, remember that no matter where you are along your journey for studying for the MCAT, you got this and you're almost there. See you next time.